Greetings from the National Archives flagship building in Washington, D.C., which sits on the ancestral lands of the Nacotchtank peoples. I'm David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's conversation between author Kate Clifford Larson and civil rights leader Joyce Ladner about Larson's new biography of civil rights leader Fannie Lou Hamer. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you about two programs coming up later this month on our YouTube channel. On Wednesday, January 12th at 1 p.m., Warren Eugene Miltier Jr. will be here to tell us about Beyond Slavery's Shadow, his new book about free people of color in the South from the colonial period through the Civil War. On Wednesday, January 19th at 1 p.m., Kevin Boyle will discuss his new book, The Shattering, America in the 1960s, which focuses on the period's fierce conflicts, the civil rights movement, rising black nationalism, Nixon-era politics of busing in the Supreme Court, and the Vietnam War. The new biography, Walk With Me, opens with Fannie Lou Hamer giving her testimony before the Credentials Committee at the 1964 Democratic National Convention. Hamer and more than 60 other members of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party had come to the convention to challenge the all-white Democratic delegation and call for more realistic representation of the people of Mississippi. In moving words that were broadcast on national television, Hamer spoke of her own struggles and encounters with violence. The transcription of that powerful speech is in the records of the Democratic National Committee, housed in the Lyndon Baines Johnson Presidential Library. FBI and Department of Justice files in the National Archives also assisted Kate Clifford Larson in telling Hamer's story. Larson's book, Walk With Me, has gathered praise from reviewers. Jill Watts, writing for the New York Times, declared, Walk With Me is a gripping and skillfully researched political biography that embeds Hamer's personal history within a compelling account of the post-World War II civil rights movement. And Christian Science Monitor's reviewer Dwight Weingarten wrote, Kate Clifford Larson's book brings Hamer's story and eventual emergence as a civil rights leader into view, providing a fresh look at the oft-repeated stories of the civil rights movement. Kate Clifford Larson is the author of Bound for the Promised Land, a biography of Harriet Tubman, Rosemary, the Hidden Kennedy Daughter, and the Assassin's Accomplice, Mary Surratt, and the Plot to Kill Abraham Lincoln. She has consulted on feature film scripts, documentaries, museum exhibits, public history initiatives, and numerous publications, and appeared on CBS Sunday Morning, the BBC, PBS, C-SPAN, and NPR. Larson is currently a Brandeis Women's Studies Research Center scholar and lives with her family outside Boston. Joyce Ladner grew up in Hattiesburg, Mississippi during the area of racial segregation. During her years of activism in the early 60s, she worked with civil rights martyrs Medgar Evers, Vernon Dahmer, and Clyde Kennard. Even though she was in college, she failed the voter registration literacy test. It did not get registered until a federal court order was granted. While enrolled in Tougaloo College, she was arrested for trying to worship at the all-white Galloway Methodist Church and spent a week in jail. She received her PhD in sociology at Washington University. She was the first woman president of Howard University, where she also served as professor of sociology. She was also a member of the United States Department of Justice's Advisory Council on Violence Against Women and the Council on Foreign Relations. She has authored, co-authored, and edited eight books. Now let's hear from Kate Clifford Larson and Joyce Ladner. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for that great introduction. And I'm really excited to be here with um, Joyce, who has become a good friend over this time that I've been researching and writing about Fannie Lou Hamer. So I'm, I'm thrilled to share um, a few images about uh, Hamer and um, to give an overview of her life story. And then, and then Joyce um, will give some words and then we'll have a discussion about uh, that civil rights movement that elevated Fannie Lou Hamer to leadership in the country. And um, I hope that you enjoy our presentation and discussion. So let me just share my screen here. Um, on and 
There we are. So uh, several years ago, I decided to write a biography of uh, research and write a biography of Fannie Lou Hamer. And um, she had been on my mind for a really long time. And actually since graduate school days back in the 1990s. And it always stuck in my mind how similar she was to my other American hero, uh, Harriet Tubman. They were both women who came out of very difficult circumstances, um, lacked um, a lot of education, formal education, and they rose really out of very um, difficult circumstances to become leaders. And it just made me think more about what the qualities are that make someone a leader when their neighbors don't rise up to become leaders or other people in their families don't. And I think that um, there are so many special things about a Hamer, and I hope that you all become interested in her and fascinated by her um, as I have over time. So uh, Hamer was born um, in Choctaw County in Mississippi in 1917. She was the 20th child of Jim and Ella Townsend. And the, the tragic thing for um, Hamer's family, seven of those children had died before uh, Fannie Lou was born. And um, the survival rate for um, black children in Mississippi at the time was, uh, was grim. Uh, one out of four died before they reached the age of five years old. So uh, Hamer was raised um, uh, in a, an incredibly uh, strict Baptist household um, with tremendous love. Her mother was a powerful figure in her life. They were sharecroppers um, on a cotton plantation. Um, they moved when Hamer was very young, three or four years old. They moved from Choctaw to Sunflower County to outside of Ruleville where uh, she spent the rest of her life. And as I said, they were sharecroppers and they struggled like many other um, black and white families who worked that system in Mississippi. She started picking cotton at the age of six to bring in a few pennies to help her family. Um, education for black children was spotty in that area. Um, she eventually achieved a sixth grade education, but by the time she was 12 or 13, she had to leave school permanently um, to pick full time with her family. Her mother became blind during the Great Depression and um, uh, something had flown up in her eye while she was out in the field um, chopping up roots. And um, because of the lack of access to health care, uh, she went blind. So by the end of the depression, the 1930s, Ella was completely blind and um, uh, Hamer's father, Jim, died of a stroke. So Hamer, 22 years old, uh, was left with the responsibility of taking care of her mother and trying to make her way in this world that was incredibly oppressive. Uh, the racism and discrimination, the violence that she and the community faced daily um, could have totally debilitated her. But she was a brilliant child and though she lacked a, 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 a complete formal education, she was an avid reader and um, she was a great observer of behavior and things that were going on in the community. She had a beautiful singing voice. Um, she was the pride of the community. Even as a child, her singing voice would carry um, you know, a, a church service and out in the field, she would sing songs. And um, she grew up to be a bit of a leader. She was a little bit of a rebel and her mother was very protective and a fierce woman and Hamer kind of took on some of those characteristics. Um, she married a, a local man, Pap Hamer, in 1944 and um, they lived on the Marlowe Plantation outside of Ruleville. And Hamer, um, later in her life, during the 1960s, when she gave uh, talks about um, the civil rights movement, she always claimed that she had no knowledge that the civil rights movement was going on in the country in the 1940s and 1950s, which seems incredulous to me. And it turns out it is because she was active in the civil rights movement in the 1950s um, in the Mississippi Delta. She um, participated in NAACP activities and 
um, attended meetings that were quite dangerous to attend. And she tried to encourage people to become, to do things, to try to improve their situation. But she was hamstrung because the ability to vote uh, for an African-American person in Mississippi was very, very difficult. And um, nearly half the population was black, but only about 5% of, of um, African-Americans were allowed to vote. The onerous literacy tests and um, poll taxes and other things that the white community used to prevent black people from voting really was quite effective and, and um, kept things from changing. So, um, but what is it that made Hamer become the leader to break out of the community in Ruleville and take on the world and um, bring messages to the rest of the country during the, the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Well, I, I link it to um, this woman, Ella Baker, here on the left hand of the screen. She worked for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Conference and Martin Luther King. And she had this great idea um, that young people would be a tremendous source of activism, and she had seen what they were doing with um, trying to integrate lunch counters throughout the South and on uh, integrate buses, and, and she could not believe the courage and the tenacity of some of these young people. So she organized the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee with young people, including uh, Bob Moses here on the right. He was a young man who had come, a uh, Harvard graduate, had come from New York city where he was a, a math teacher and he was very attracted to what was going on in the South and he worked with Ella Baker. Um, and she sent him to Mississippi in 1961 to start organizing people and helping them, finding out what they needed, what they wanted, and to find ways to make those things happen. And in um, the summer of 1962, Bob Moses and um, a group of young SNCC leaders arrived in Ruleville and held a meeting at Hamer's Church, William Chapel, there in Ruleville. And they were there to convince the local residents to try to register to vote. And Hamer had reached a point in her life where she felt that something had to change more than what she was trying to do. She had experienced what I viewed as a, uh, a crossroads in her life. Um, for years, she and her husband, Pap, had tried to have children together, um, but she had fertility issues, uh, fibroid tumors that were preventing her from having a successful pregnancy. And in 1961, um, the plantation owner's wife um, suggested that she have surgery and remove the tumor so that she could get pregnant. So she went to this white doctor, Dr. Charles Doro, and he said that he could take care of it. Well, what he did was sterilize her without her permission. And when she found out, it devastated her. It sent her into a tremendous depression. But she pulled herself out of it and decided that she needed to change things. Something had to change. That This couldn't happen again. And other Black women in the community, and actually around the country, were receiving these forced sterilizations or sterilizations without their permission. And she did not want to feel helpless anymore. So she went to this meeting and she later said about those young SNCC workers that they were like the new kingdom on earth, that they had come to listen and to help and inspire them. And she was truly inspired by what they said that day in August of 1962. She decided to try to register to vote um, and so she went with a group of 17 other Ruleville residents to the, um, uh, the county seat in Indianola, and she tried to register to vote. She took the test, failed the test, as did all the other people that tried to register that day. And when she got home to the plantation that night, her landlord, um, W.D. Marlowe, evicted her. <clears throat> and he said that Mississippi wasn't ready for that. And it, it shook Hamer to her core that this was going to happen. But it also convinced her that she needed to stand up and fight. Um, this is a picture of um, a Theron Lind. He was a, <clears throat> a, a county clerk in another county, <clears throat> excuse me, in Mississippi, who was notorious 
<clears throat> excuse me, for um, uh, not letting people pass the test. And he defied court order after court order throughout the uh, early to mid 1960s, the federal government forcing him to um, let people reg register to vote. He was a terrible, terrible person. <clears throat> but Hamer, um, exhibited leadership skills that Bob Moses in particular noticed right away that she appeared to be a leader in the community. So SNCC hired her to be a field worker. And um, she, um, she, she blossomed and she became an amazing speaker on the stage. And in fact, one of the um, civil rights veterans who was a very young man at the time when she started appearing on stages in Mississippi, um, Dr. Leslie Burr McLemore said um, that he recalled that, quote, she was the star, the person that all of them were wowed by. No one equaled her storytelling. She testified, preached. She led them in rousing freedom songs. She was the center of attraction, he said. Um, another civil rights veteran said she was a powerhouse. She would shine her light and people caught that spirit. So, she really moved people and empowered young people and old people, older people. And um, she had been through so much, she was just going to keep fighting to get what she wanted, the right to vote and more, equality, justice. Um, SNCC sent her to take different classes um, in different places around the South. And in June of 1963, she traveled to, um, uh, Georgia and South Carolina for citizenship training classes and other classes in nonviolent protest techniques and um, uh, how to help people take those literacy tests, et cetera. And she went with a group of, of young SNCC people, including um, here, June Johnson on the left, who's holding the sign, I wonder is white power dying? And on the, the right here is Anel Ponder, um, a teacher from Atlanta. And they rode the bus to um, uh, South Carolina and back. And along the way, they tested whether the lunch counters and the restrooms at each bus station were integrated because by federal law, they were supposed to be. And they had no problem until on their way back, they stopped in Winona, Mississippi. Um, and the restaurant was segregated and so were the restrooms. Um, and they made comments to the proprietor and the police arrived and arrested them and threw them in jail. And over four days, they were brutally, brutally beaten. And um, Hamer, Hamer was sexually assaulted and she almost, you know, she almost died. Um, and in, in, the, in the jail, she asked um, her cellmates to sing walk with me jesus the the spiritual the song it helped her survive those dark dark hours when no one was coming to help them but she did survive and they were released on um june 12 1963 just hours after medgar evers had been assassinated um in his front yard in uh, jackson mississippi so it was a it was a, a incredible moment for her to come out of that alive and then to learn that this great leader in Mississippi had been assassinated. But she, in a sense, was reborn again and she was determined that she was going to keep fighting, that they weren't going to keep her quiet. And as a matter of fact, she used to tell audiences, quote, if them crackers in Winona thought they'd discourage me from fighting, I guess they found out different. I'm going to stay in Mississippi and if they shoot me down, I'll be buried here. She was more determined than ever. And the violence that was being perpetrated in Mississippi is just, just stunning and against these young SNCC workers and local residents who supported them. So um, more and more SNCC workers arrived. Oh, this is a picture of um, Fannie Lou Hamer's husband, Pap. Um, it's a photograph taken by Maria Varela and he's cooking cracklins in a pot out in the yard. And he helped cook food for these young SNCC workers. And um, he held down the household while Fannie Lou Hamer was off giving lectures and speeches and, and trying to um, help people register to vote. They did adopt two girls, uh, Dorothy and Virgie. So he had the responsibility of raising them at home when she was gone. So these young SNCC workers um, 
worked uh, to help people register to vote, to encourage them to do that. In the summer of 1964, they held what was called Mississippi Freedom Summer along with other um, civil rights organizations and they brought 850 uh, volunteers to Mississippi to start freedom schools and um, community centers and to help people register to vote. So it was a, a huge movement. The backlash was tremendous, however, and um, many people were injured. Um, Hamer was threatened nearly daily, and, um, and some civil rights workers were murdered um, by white supremacists who didn't want change coming to Mississippi. Hamer also helped start uh, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which was um, a party to represent um, mostly African Americans who were not allowed to vote, and some of the arguments of white voters in Mississippi was that black people didn't want to vote, so it didn't, you know, what does it matter? And she and the rest of them helped prove that, of course, black Mississippians wanted to vote. So they had uh, mock elections to prove that people were willing to come out and vote for the candidates of their choice. Eventually, they decided to challenge the um, Mississippi All-White Democratic Party as it was getting ready to attend the National Democratic National Convention in Atlantic City in August of 1964. They wanted to challenge the seating of the All-White Party as it did not represent all Mississippians and they wanted to be able to vote for the Democratic candidates um, for president and vice president. So Hamer and a group of 68 uh, Mississippians, part of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, presented their challenge to the Credentials Committee at the Democratic National Convention that August. And um, Hamer's impassioned speech wowed everybody. In fact, um, some people wept when they heard her speech. It was about seven or eight minutes long. Um, she had much more powerful impact than Martin Luther King who spoke that day and other civil rights leaders who spoke. She spoke from the heart. She did not read notes and she told the audience and the world because it was being filmed by NBC News that the world had to know what was happening in Mississippi, the violence and the terror that was being rained down upon the black community. And she said, and President Johnson heard this, she said, and if the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America the land of the free and the home of the brave, where our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America? President Johnson had interrupted the news coverage of her speech because he knew how powerful she was, but he needed the white Democratic delegates to vote for him for to nominate him for the presidency. So he made a deal behind her back and um, agreed to seat the all white delegation. Hamer was devastated that this happened, but she went home to fight some more. And in 1968, she succeeded in um, having the, uh, the reformulated Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party called the Loyalists seated at the Democratic Convention in Chicago. And there she argued for um, more uh, inclusion of women and, and um, African Americans. She wanted the Democratic platform to discuss universal health care, preschool education, um, poverty programs, et cetera, things that we're still actually arguing for today. Um, but she had a huge impact. Her health suffered dramatically as a result of the beating in the Winona jail, and it declined throughout the 1960s and especially into the 1970s. But she continued to fight for her community. She op opened a freedom farm where people could grow their own food. She had a pig bank where people could um, uh, get pigs uh, to feed themselves. And she helped found the National Women's Political Caucus um, she was against the Vietnam War. She just continued to campaign and fight for equal rights and civil rights and more. Um, she died in 1977, uh, complications from breast cancer, um, but her legacy lives on and boy, it seems more important now today than ever as we continue to face um, the struggles of voting rights and more communities are trying to take those rights away.
So I'm going to hand this over to, to Joyce and um, I will stop sharing this. This, um, There we go. Joyce, it's nice to see you. Nice to see you too, Kate. And thank you so much um, for that overview of Mrs. Hamer's life. Um, I met Mrs. Hamer when I was a sophomore in college in 1962. But my sister, Dory, was one of those SNCC workers who uh, went to the Delta and accompanied Mrs. Hamer and, uh, oh, I guess about what 20 or so other people when they went to the courthouse in um, Indianola to attempt to register to vote. After the owner Milo, uh, of Milo's plantation evicted her and had some of the workers on the plantation set her furniture alongside the road. Um, my sister Dory and other SNCC workers helped to move that furniture to a safe place until Mrs. Hamer found a place to live. Um, but Mrs. Hamer never looked back, as you said, once she got involved in the movement. She, she joined SNCC, she, the NAACP and the SCLC um, had no doubt wanted her to work with them at some point, I would assume. But she always told us, and I was a member of SNCC, she said, I, I prefer working with the young people because they're not afraid uh, to take chances. And, uh, and she told us that we didn't second guess ourselves and that we were ready to get out there on the front lines and, and really bring about su substantial changes in Mississippi. Um, I also attended Mrs. Hamer's funeral in 1977. And I remember it. and Andrew Young, Reverend Andrew Young, who was then amb US ambassador to the United Nations, uh, eulogized her. And he said that the hands that picked cotton also just picked the president. And he was referring to President Carter. Uh, it was a sad ending for Mrs. Hamer because she never ever uh, received the economic benefits that she fought for, for other people. She was born, I mean, she was um, born into poverty and she was still in poverty at her death. Um, and I like to think that had we only known um, so many of us young people had gone on to, to start our lives and so on. But I, I wish that we had paid closer attention to her back in Mississippi, perhaps we could have helped her more uh, or helped her at all. Mrs. Hamer, I met Mrs. Hamer, as I said, when I was, when I was 17, 18 years old, I was a sophomore in college. And she definitely commanded the room, the stage. And she, um, she had the most powerful singing voice. And she also, um, she was very, very charismatic. Um, very, uh, what shall I say? Um, she didn't put on airs at all. She she never got lost her homespun wisdom or her uh, deep abiding faith in God that she often invoked. She uh, always sang the song, This Little Light of Mine, I'm Gonna Let It Shine. That was her signature song. Uh, whether she was on stage and New York City, or back at, uh, in her church, William Chapel, um, she remained the same person. She, she, as we said in the South, did not put on airs. Uh, and all of the exposure she had to a very different uh, world than that which she'd grown up in, including uh, going with SNCC people to uh, Conner Creek, Guinea after the Mississippi Freedom Summer. She never ever changed. She remained the same person. And I think that's one of the traits of, of um, gifted leaders, um, that there's something about one's background uh, that one finds strength in. Without a doubt, Mrs. Hamer's strength came from uh, her, her, her background that where she'd grown up and the soil of Ruleville, Mississippi, the Delta soil remained with her, even though she had all of these other experiences. Um, 
I remember going to uh, Atlantic City to the Democratic National Convention in 1964. And I remember how crestfallen we all were when the decision was made to seat um, a handful of people and instead of, uh, to, to seat the entire uh, all white delegation of Mississippians and to reserve a handful of seats. How many was it, Kay, was it four? I think it was just two seats. Two yeah. seats, two seats. And um, Mrs. Hamer quipped, I didn't come here, we didn't come here for no two seats. All of us is tired. And she found no difficulty whatsoever in rejecting this uh, paltry uh, um, compromise um, because it didn't represent all that she and the other delegates of the MFDP had fought for. Um, and and uh, I think that, that that summed up who Mrs. Hamer was, that, that she always fought and fought and fought. And despite not receiving much in return, personal, I mean, she, her, her gifts were intrinsic. I mean, her, or the gifts she received rather were intrinsic. Um, and she never, fought for money for herself. Um, but I, I remember too that, that Mrs. Hamer adopted two daughters. And um, after she found out that she had been um, given a, a, a made sterile, given a hysterectomy, uh, or actually her tubes were tied, I think, uh, without her knowledge or consent. Um, she didn't give up on having fam a family. She, she and Pap adopted two young girls that they raised, and one of them died um, very early on uh, after she, I guess when she had reached adulthood. And one, one uh, uh, rumor was that she had died because of complications of malnutrition. I'm not sure. Is that, would that be it the case? Was, uh, she had anemia mm -hmm. and... Um, because of lack of access to good health care, she got pregnant a second time, had a baby, and the anemia just, uh, it just took over her body and she died. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, I remember her granddaughter came to Washington a couple of years ago for the March on Washington Film Festival, uh, at which we honored Mrs. Hamer, Victoria Grave, my cousin, uh, and Mrs. Anna Devine, who all, all of whom ran for Congress um, uh, in a mock election. And actually, Mrs. I think Mrs. Hamer got more votes than Senator Eastland, was it? Is that true? Uh, she didn't get more votes, but she got a significant number. But of course, the white Mississippi folks wouldn't count those votes. Yeah, Right. They were not counted. But they, those three came on to Washington, and she had a captive audience um, uh, in the Congress when uh, they came in and, uh, uh, but at any rate, uh, Mrs. Hamer was like so many of the other black women I had grown up around. She was like my aunts. Uh, she was like my mother. My mother was like Mrs. Hamer. They were all very, very strong people who rose to the occasion, who didn't expect a lot out of life um, because life had never dealt them a good hand. They all said that if you get an education, no one can take it from you. That was my mother's mantra to, to us when, as we were growing up. And I remember thinking that my mother and Mrs. Hamer and so many other these women had had their labor taken from them. They'd had every single thing that was material um, taken from them by the white power structure, that they were paid very, very paltry wages, maybe $2 a day for cleaning a house um, and, uh, or in the fields as Mrs. Hamer um, and her family never made enough money uh, to come out in the clear or to make any profit rather uh, at the end of the cotton picking season so that they were always in debt uh, to the uh, plantation owner. I guess what I'm saying is that they had a hope for us. I remember one time Mrs. Hamer said to me, so you're, 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 uh, Dora's sister, uh, it's so good to meet you. And um, 
you're getting an education. Nobody's going to take that from you. And and I remember that resonated with what my mother and others, grandmother had always told us, uh, that that education was that, um, shall I say, and it was almost an intrinsic acquisition that couldn't uh, uh, be destroyed. But at any rate, that's about what I have to say about Mrs. Hamer. Uh, you showed the picture of Theron Lynn, the, um, uh, who was in charge of, of the registrar of voting in my county, Harris, Mississippi. And on that same day that you sh that picture was taken, I had attempted to register to vote. And of the three times I tried, um, I never passed the test, but that was, that was Freedom Day in Hattiesburg. And um, Mrs. Hamer, there's another photograph of Mrs. Hamer picketing in front of the courthouse that day. Um, she was indeed an extraordinary person. Um, one like we have not seen since. She's amazing. And, and speaking of that moment, just so that the audience knows that these um, Theron Lind and other registrars like him would pass white people who took the test who were illiterate, they couldn't even right. write their names, and they would be allowed to vote. So it was it was a cruel, horrific system. And you're right, Hamer just would not stop. But she was so inspired by the young people. They gave her that energy. And right. while she mentored them, they gave her so much. And she talked about how um, she felt that there was more Christianity in the group of SNCC students than she ever saw in a church. And that made me laugh because she battled with some of those ministers in those churches who are too afraid to have meetings because they, you know, they didn't want to confront the white power structure. But she was... Oh, she was ballsy. She, <laughs> she, was. she was an incredibly honest person and, and her strength came from her fundamental beliefs. You know, those that were taught to her by her mother, Ella, uh, those that were uh, taught to her by her sometimes minister father uh, but her, and her community is very important about her community that always supported her no matter what. But yes. she, she had this just a fundamental beliefs that we don't see very often in anyone. Yeah. Uh, and she, they guided her rather than any, the, that's why the fame never went to her head, as we would say. Uh, she was unimpressed by uh, uh, speaking with people in high office or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but Mrs. The, that day when I registered, tried to register to vote, uh, one of the questions on, there were two questions. One was, essay questions. And, you know, who writes an essay question <laughs> for to try to register vote? Um, but one was, what are the duties of a good citizen? And I wrote, knowing that they were not, he was not going to pass me. The duties of a good citizen are to obey just laws and to disobey unjust laws. And I was standing there at the counter and he went and seeing distance, you know, back over to where his secretary was. And they talked and he Look down at my at my application, and then he look over at me, and at one point, do it again, and then at one point I waved at him. <laughs> um, but he that registrar and others um, who sometimes will ask black people how many uh, bubbles are in a bar of soap, or how many grains of sand are in a quart jar, but at the same time. Theron Lynn got on the phone and called white people and told them, you're registered to vote. Now come on down here and vote, you know, when, when it's time to vote. Um, and or a black person could be killed. In fact, one of my mentors, Vernon Damer, who was head of the Hattiesburg NAACP, um, was in fact murdered in 1966 because he told, um, there was also a poll tax required and you had, you had to pay maybe a couple of dollars a year. Uh, and you had to keep all your receipts in order uh, before you could, that was one of the other qualifications of voting. And he had a store and he got on the radio and he told people to come, black people to come to his store and he would pay their poll tax for them. Um, and he was murdered um, hours, I, I believe, maybe the next night or, or so. Yeah. By, 
the head of the NAACP, I mean, the uh, Ku Klux Klan in nearby Laurel. The um, violence was, is, it, you know, when I was doing the research for the book, I, it's stunning to me, just stunning the, the violence and there were no repercussions to these white supremacists who were doing it. And everybody knew who they were. And, right. you know, it, it's just uh, incredible, incredible. Was, uh, the fortitude for, for people to stand up and fight. It is remarkable looking back yeah. on that. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I link it to the emergence of the violence today. And we're going into a second phase of uh, post-reconstruction, but also of second phase of the 60s violence in a way. Um, because we, on, it's fortuitous that today is January 6th. And a year ago, we saw this incredible violence uh, unleashed on the U.S. Capitol. Yeah. And um, homegrown terrorists that were ignored for a long time. And all of a sudden, you know, police are recognizing them and they've grown, you know, just by leaps and bounds. Right, because they've been allowed to. They've, they've been, been allowed to and are very, very threatening. But that's the kind of, same kind of violence, but it was worse in Mississippi and in the other parts of the Deep South uh, because there was, nothing was done about them. And they hid behind the sheet of the Ku Klux Klan or they bombed your house and or torched it uh, in the dead of night when people were asleep. I remember Mr. Damer, um, when they shot into his home and torched a firebomb into it at the same time, simultaneously, he got his wife and two young children out. And then he went back into the house with his shotgun and started shooting at them so his family could drive away. Um, and that's when he got his uh, sustained um, um, burns, but also uh, smoke inhalation, and he died uh, the next day. And that's when I lost my innocence there. That in Atlantic City, when yeah. Mrs. Hamer and others were not seated. Yeah, I, uh, it's amazing how the more gains that were made during the 1960s, the more uh, the backlash was from the white communities in in Mississippi and other southern states. It was. Yeah, exactly. a direct correlation to the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1964 and then the passage of the Voting Rights Act 1965 and those SNCC workers doing voter registration, everything that changed, desegregation of, you know, uh, bus terminals and things, everything triggered this violent response on the part of, of the white supremacists. And a uh, parallel today um, okay, <clears throat> is that the Voting Rights Act is still up again for, uh, I mean, is under uh, just the greatest challenge since the 1960s. Yeah, I agree. They dismantled parts of that 1965 Voting Rights Act in 2013 with Shelby right. v. Holder in the Supreme Court. Yeah. And now we're seeing what happens when when you take those, those securities away that <clears throat> certain states and certain, you know, citizens will try their best to deny others the right to vote. Absolutely. And that's, I mean, history repeating itself in the worst kind of way. Um, mm -hmm. But, but um, you chose a, a, just a fantastic subject because we all knew Mrs. Hamer's life story and, and her, her power and her courage and so on. Um, but now the world can know it through your wonderful book. Thank you. Thank you. And you know what? I, I hope that when people read the book, not only do they learn about Hamer as a remarkable human being, um, but also that, you know, ordinary people can do extraordinary things. Exactly. It That's isn't all the Martin Luther Kings of the world. It's, right. you know, it's everyday people in our communities across this country that can do, have been doing, will continue to do extraordinary things. And that Hamer was supported. She, someone identified her, and supported her. I'm, I'm thinking of Bob Moses and other SNCC uh, activists, and supported her and gave her a platform. All she needed was a platform, and boy, did she just take it. And there are people like that today that could do use our help, use the support. We need to elevate those leaders. Absolutely, um, she was just there waiting to be, as you said, to be discovered. And, uh, and, or, and also she, her powerful, um, so she had a powerful sense of self and an anger 
over the injustices of the environment. But it was her life was really infused with, you know, her love for her family and her community and her profound faith. Because that faith fortified her during those really dark hours when other people would have shrunk away and hidden and just never stepped out in the light of day again. She found that strength in her faith that made her move forward. There were some very fundamental beliefs that she acquired growing up, you know. Um, One was just a very powerful belief in God, and it helped her to cope. I mean, because she she just felt that um, there was a hereafter, there, that there was a power that she could rely on to keep her going, you know. Um, and she never lost her faith, never, ever. And I think that as she got older, it became more important for her to rely on, you know, because when and, all and, failed, and he- and human beings disappointed her. There were many people that disappointed her, and but her faith never, it never disappointed her. She knew she could turn to that and she'd find that strength and stability. But there were human beings that she was deeply disappointed with because she yeah. saw the world very, she, very specifically in, in very black and white terms and it right. was not negotiable. There was no right. negotiating. So other people would negotiate around her and and that disappointed her tremendously. Exactly. I mean, I think that sometimes if you you're better off if 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 you don't have a lot of nuance in your life when when uh difficult times um uh hit you because she if you have that fundamental faith, you can go back to it, but if you're questioning certainly as I did in college, you know, when I was arrested well, am I agnostic or am I, or am I a believer or whatever? But for Mrs. Hamer, there was no such question. You know, she, she was a believer and she just held on to that, that faith, the faith of her mothers and fathers, you know. And she knew there was a moral, there was a moral compass. There were, it was a, a moral fight that she was facing. And that's, that's what drove her. She just would not compromise. There was just now um, Dr. Martin Luther King might compromise or some of the other big civil rights leaders. They understood politics in certain ways and they might compromise. But she was she just couldn't. She wouldn't. In fact, in Atlantic City, um, at the Democratic National Convention in 1964, uh, Martin Luther King was among those uh, who urged her to comp- accept the, the two seats um, and. She said, no. I mean, others said, uh, well, you, you can at least get a foot in the door. And she didn't want a, a foot in the door. She wanted to take everybody else with her. She wanted all of them to have uh, to go through that door. Um, one of the things I remember uh, about Atlantic City was that the, the, um, some of the SNCC guys uh, towed the car that Goodman sworn in and James Cheney uh, were in when they, the three civil rights workers, when they were murdered in, in um, um, Meridian, not Meridian, but Neshoba County, Mississippi. And they brought that car to the boardwalk. Uh, and everybody, you know, there were people, just thousands of people, and they were all walking past that car. And they wanted to know, what is this uh, burned out car is doing here on the boardwalk? And, you know, we had people who uh, would stand there and explain to them what happened. Why was that burned out car there? It was because three civil rights workers had gotten a call that a church had been burned. They went to check it out and they were jailed. And when they were released from jail at night, a near night, uh, the sheriff had had time to round up uh, the Ku Klux Klan's type people uh, to follow them and to um, uh, murder them, to shoot them. And then they were, were burned. I mean, were in, I was about to say interred. They were already did, but they were, they were put in this big, um, uh, you know, when you have a lot of sand and rocks and not rocks, but like a dam, it was an earthen. Earthen yeah. dam, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and covered over. 
And while the FBI was out looking for them for weeks, that's where they were. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, they had left Atlantic City, not Atlantic City, I'm sorry, um, um, Western University College in Ohio, where the SNCC training was going on for the, for the uh, students who were going to participate in Freedom Summer, 1964. And when they got that call, they jumped in the car and drove back to Mississippi. And they were lured back there, you know, right. and, right. and, and met their fate. And Mrs. Hamer's faith never shrunk. Right. Uh, she rode, I think she rode back with Rita Schwerner, um, Mickey yes. Schwerner's wife. Uh, you know, she knew in her gut that they were, they had been killed. She, right. you know, yes, they weren't right. in jail somewhere. They had been killed. She just knew it. And I knew two of the three civil rights workers, um, Mickey Swerner, whose wife, Rita, you just referred to, and um, James Cheney. James Cheney was a local boy guy. And, Ms., and uh, Mickey Swerner and Rita Swerner had come down to Mississippi earlier. Um, I guess the year prior to then, 63, to uh, work full time in the movement from, that came from Brooklyn. And, you know, I think about now about having known Medgar Evers when I was a very young person and um, known James Cheney, Mickey Swerner, Vernon Damer, all of these people were murdered and I knew them, but yet we kept the faith and we kept going. It is stunning that you all just kept fighting and moving and making change. It just is remarkable despite that massive resistance. Um, what, what else were you going to do, essentially? You know, nobody left the movement. They didn't leave because they were scared, uh, because part of your security was in numbers. There were other people who felt as you did, who believed in you doing, they had your back, you know. Right. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Um, so <clears throat> the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission, which was like Mississippi's own little FBI, um, and they they did a lot of bad things and they monitored all the civil rights workers and they knew what was going on uh, and what the white supremacists were doing. So well, the question is, were any of the officials identified in the Mississippi Sovereignty Archives charged with federal crimes? Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They were not. There were there were some documents, but, you know, they, they say everything is there. I think there are a lot of documents that are missing, but I don't well, know. They, they were removed. A lot of the documents were, in fact, removed. And one, they, they asked, um, there were two people, both of whom were my professors, Ed King, and who was a chaplain at Tougaloo College where I attended, and um, uh, John Salter. And they reviewed a lot of the documents, and I, I think they removed some of them. Um, I know Ed King was very defensive about why he removed them, but you know, I would rather have taken my chances on seeing all of the all of the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember they, they the Sovereign Commission that I have a handful of files in there, the collection, and one of them was when the Sovereign Commission, two two guys on the commission went to Hattiesburg, Mississippi, my hometown, to look for dirt on us, as they said. Um, and uh, just in case, and I've often wondered just in case what are they going to be able to quickly um, litter the media with horrible things about a Dory and me, you know? Um, uh, they even went to the home of someone who, who um, had known my father, but hadn't known him for many years. I mean, it was just horrible. They went to my school principal. Yeah. And he said, I can't tell anything bad about them. You know, they were good girls and, and made good grades. Right. They were, but they were, yeah, they were always trying to dig up dirt on everybody and manufacturing stuff. And they always wanted to label all the, the activists as communists and right. socialists and whatever. But I remember someone tried to, uh, told the governor of Mississippi that Hamer was a madam who ran a house of oh my God. And he even told President Johnson that. And, you know, Johnson, I could just see him shaking really? his head. He hated those 
those uh, Southern delegates, he was so irritated. He knew that they were racist, and but he needed their votes. Right. And uh, yeah, so the things in those records, uh, they're stunning, the stuff that they would do and how they would ignore the violence. They would report it maybe, but they would just say, you know, these young people are stirring up trouble and yeah. it's their fault. Yeah. Their comment is from New York. That was a favorite line. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. They were infiltrating the communities and, and uh, yeah, it was dangerous, very dangerous. Exactly. One yeah. of the people you mentioned in, um, in, uh, in photographs you showed was that of June Johnson, um, who was beaten at the Winona, um, by the Winona Mississippi police where Mrs. Hamer was beaten so severely. And June was 14 when she came into the movement. So. When she was beaten in Winona, she couldn't have been more than 15. She was like 15, yeah, 14, 15, yeah. Right, right. Um, and and I knew June so well. And I always, I mean, she, she died um, maybe 10 years ago or so. And I just, that's one of the heartbreak when I think about her. The scars, yeah, that they bore for the rest of their lives, Anel Ponder, June, right. um, Uvester Simpson, it's just, it, it is tragic. We have a couple more questions. Um, what about the Voting Rights Reauthorization and Amendments Act of 2006? Well, it was voted on, but now Republicans won't vote to reauthorize, so, you know, it, it's meaningless. And um, Fannie Lou Hamer's story is probably taught in some public schools, but I don't know if it's part of a regular curriculum. I know in Mississippi, it has been part of the public school curriculum, although there are efforts now to kind of tone down that, that curriculum, um, but I don't know. Do you know anything about that? No, I don't, I don't. Uh, but with the, if you think about the context of the current times uh, where some, Books are being banned, such as the books by uh, Toni Morrison. And by the way, the book that was banned is uh, now, I mean, the sales have gone, gone through the roof, I'm told. <laughs> That's the great thing that happens with these bannings. Um, but this current environment of banning, I wouldn't be surprised if, if some uh, of these white parents would come forth and say that they didn't want their children reading about this because it would make them feel guilty or feel badly. Yeah. Every American should know this story so that we don't repeat it. You know, we've got to do better. You know, and the lessons from Mrs. Hamer's life are, are very, very important for young people to learn. And that is that, that honesty and, and the strong belief system, believing in something outside yourself mm -hmm. uh, would certainly reduce a lot of the narcissism we see. Uh, believing in some fundamental things in life. I mean, what my mother always said, it, your belief can't be worth very much if you can't defend it, you know? That's right. Joyce, we're being asked to wrap it up. That's a perfect way to end this discussion. Thank you so much for doing this with me. And, and thank, thank you. I, I, I'm just so happy. I just told you earlier that I've taken on very new friends at this age of my life. And I'm glad to count you as a new friend. <laughs> Same here. Thank you, Joyce. <laughs> and good luck with the sales of your book. Thank you very much. And I can't wait to see your memoir. Well, let's finish it. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to finish it. I'm motivated now. When I saw what you did with Mrs. Hamer's life, I just have to believe I've got to finish my obligation. That's right. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Take care. <laughs>